want to say what to be vulgar in a green sport. about ancient theaters and their global influence in arts and sciences. When you're visiting there in Macaranian and Toledo, you don't, you don't wait to see ancient ruins and ancient theaters. The truth is there are eight, six ancient theaters which are spread out in the entire area. There are still ancient theaters that have not been excavated yet, like the one in Thermos. In Macaranian, you can find three of them. Today, you have visited the ancient theater of Stratos. Stratos was the capital of the area of Macaranian and is located in the middle of the region and was considered as a natural border between Atolia and Akanania. The theater was built on a small hill overlooking the Thedos River inside the walls of the ancient city of Stratos. The position of the theater was first discovered in 1805. All the Tafas initiatives satisfy our mission of since we give an opportunity to a few friends from different countries to visit and see our village. We would like to make our village known with its the hope that it will help us to develop with whatever that it lies. ITAFAP's mission is to take this area known to as many people as possible by inviting them to visit the area of Canania. The annual, meeting, the annual meeting in the village of Sardinia serves this purpose. The area of Canania, in particular its traditional villages like Sardinia, have not been affected by the booming of Greek tourism of the last half century. The purpose of, the purpose of this meeting is not to promote such type of uh, development. On the contrary, the future of this area lies on doing what it's done for thousands of years but benefit for the new technology international experience which promotes productivity without undermining the natural beauty of the area. Unlike other areas of Greece, the area is rich in clean waters, fauna and flora. It combines the natural beauty of forests, through no forests, with the beauty of the uh, Ambracian Falls. I was close my little intervention by reading uh, a part from the article of Rupert Richardson, which was published in 1901 in the American Geographical Society and was an inspiration for all of us. Since I took my first hasty glimpse of Akananian Anatolia in 1894, the region has grown powerfully, and I have made four other visits there, more careful and on longer durations than the first one. The particular charm which I felt at the first neglecting is imposed upon me to each first visit. It's a neglected corner of Greece. Not one in 500 of strangers who visit Greece think of paying a, a visit through Anatolian Akananian. I wish you a nice day and hope to see you again in future meetings of our organization. Thank you very much. Thank you. And now I would like to welcome uh, Professor uh, Hugh Gorman, uh, who is Professor and Head of Performance at California State University in Long Beach and co executive Director at the National Alliance of Packing Fixers Faculty. Mitza, the Michael Seco Association of America. Today he's going to talk about ancient theaters, modern stories, community, communion, and campuses. And 18% is from there. That's yeah, that's so what I was. Yeah. <laughs> that is true. <laughs> so thank you, Thomas. Uh, this one is take a 
moment and thank you, Gregory, for putting this together for, for all of us. Um, as uh, Gregory just said, 18% Greek, I just did 23 and me, right? So some of you may have done that. Um, and my grandfather left the, a village 50 kilometers from here in 1910. Um, so I stand here today, the talk I'm going to give is about ancient theater. Um, it's about how we connect with each other, communion, catharsis, where we stand in relationship to that with technology. But for me, it always comes back to local stories, because um, I think we must invest in things that matter to us locally. And so I'm very moved to be here in front of you this morning because I'm thinking about my grandfather right now. I'm thinking about he left this village not far from here. He was an orphan at 12. He made his way to Ellis Island and built a community in Illinois. And uh, my mom came out of that, one of 13 Greek children. She went to the Juilliard School in New York. She was an opera singer in New York. And uh, it's very moving. Uh, so I'm standing here in front of you as a theater person who grew up in the theater, going to talk about theater. Uh, but also uh, Greek, uh, it's very moving. So thank you, Gregory, for putting this together today. I think our relationship to our parents is huge. right? And to give them honor and Thomas, your parents, uh, we want to honor that. And thank you, Olga, for all you do for Adner. And, I mean, you are just a joy to deal with the co correspondence makes it so easy for us. So, so I'm going to talk a little bit, I thought, was like, what could I share with you today about, I'm a professional actor, I've been a professional actor for 30 years. I started as a child with an intelligent film. I run acting programs. I'm less of an academic, more of an actor. So I thought, well, how can I tie some of the issues that maybe, I'm trying to tell a local story with all of us today. What is the local story we have in common is that we teach with professors and we have our students. So what is the relationship and some of the struggles that I experience and maybe I can get a conversation started with us today so at lunch we can talk more about some of our relationships to our students today. And I'm trying to filter that through the lens of the theater. But I'm going to start and I'll beg your, uh, your forgiveness, Gregory. I'm going to start with a quote from an Italian tragedian. Her name is Eleanor Dusa. Dusa was arguably the greatest actress of the 20th century. Uh, she uh, is known for ushering in uh, naturalism. And she was famously Sarah Bernhardt's rival. But I thought this would be a nice place, an appropriate place to kind of open in the morning. And, and gentlemen, I think maybe you you said that the Italians were of Greek origin. <laughs> <laughs> so I exaggerated all as well. <laughs> There's nothing to worry about. Um, and so the timing starts now. <laughs> 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 yeah. So this is Eleanor Hughes, her words. Do you know how the theater originated? Theater began as an offshoot of religion with the singular purpose of helping us understand, all of us, what it means to be human in all its poignancy, its humor, and its devastation. As our ancestors gazed up at the stars, as we can imagine this morning I'm doing, trying to fathom our purpose, the high priestess of the tribe, the shaman, would recount the stories of the past, enacting the different roles, the hero, the beloved, the antagonist allowing his body temporarily to become possessed and letting the spirit archetypes channel through him. This was the original acting. It meant dissolving the ego. I call it the grace. In those moments when the grace flows, I feel connected to the entire universe. Eleanor is beautiful. And so as someone who trains young people every day, I, I, I'm challenged with the question. I run an MFA program, a BA program, a BFA program. How do we help young people channel their grace? Right? How do we help them channel the spirit of our ancient ancestors and this shamanistic ability to vibrate theatrically? Well, I look to the stories of the ancient Greeks, and I see that they were local stories, stories that were fundamentally about the local community. And the edifices that they performed in were much more than just architecture. I know 
know some of you are going to speak about these things today. They were spiritual calmers, right? Even the amphitheater we saw this morning, right? It had meaning, purpose, beyond just telling theatrical stories. It was a meeting place, democracy, discussions. Aeschylus is the Persian. Think about it. it was a local story, right? Certainly, the Athenians were directly connected to that story, and the props used in the production were from the actual war itself. So, the more local something is, like this community that you're trying to provide, like, the more we listen and care because it affects us personally. We sit up when it directly affects us. We listen, we pay attention. So, the ancient Greeks understood the need to construct a community create opportunities for communion, and then have moments of catharsis for their own social health and spiritual well-being. This went far beyond just the performance itself, as many of you here know well. So as a person that has to train young people to kind of go to this transcendent place in their imagination, in their bodies, I look to the Dionysian experience as a, as kind of a benchmark. So what was this Dionysian celebration? Well, fertility, as we know dance, right, inebriation, of course, right, heightened expression, and of course, sexuality. So all of these things were exchanges of energy, just like what's happening right now. I'm in front of you, you're in the Teatron, I'm in the orchestra, right, and we're exchanging human energy. We're in a room together, and it's important, this coming together. So what is Duza's explanation of acting, if not a Dionysian exploration, right? This exchange of human energy is what it's all about. So, as she said, it's a way to become one with the universe. And I don't think she's just making that up or being you know, hyperbolic about it. When you get in that state of flow, or what sports psychology might now call the zone, you feel like everything inside of you is a human at your, your fingertips, that you're alive, you're present, you're awake, you're here. And I believe that that was what the purpose of actually the edifices of the theaters themselves, to create a space, a sacred space to come into so we can all be a little more awake and move society forward. So the structures themselves, when I think about it as an actor, I've been walking on stage my entire life, ever since I was a kid. My, my mom was hired by Oscar Hammerstein way back in the day in 1946, when the, production of showboat. So ever since I was a little kid, I've always been walking through the paradise. It is a spiritual ritual of walking through this threshold, stepping out onto the orchestra and knowing how to dance somehow with your humanity. That is, the orchestra is called the dancing place. Yeah? And the ancient Greeks believed that this dance was healing. Well, we think of it maybe in a medical way as a healing, but not necessarily a medical, a spiritual way. What does it mean to dance with your humanity? Yeah? Then there's the scheme, right? It's going to support the scene. But I really want to just focus a little bit today on the, on the theatron, a place for seeing. Because right now, I'm seeing you. I'm not reading my paper. I'm seeing you. Right? And this ability to come into a place and see each other. I struggle with this every day in the room with my students because this is what I see. <laughs> <laughs> I see an egocentric existence. And my job is to get in there and just go, hello, hello, hello. We're here, not here. So this struggle, and I'm very empathic towards my students. I love them. But it is a struggle, as many of you probably know. I'd love to hear your stories at lunch, right? They have trouble seeing beyond themselves. They can't see out. Or they're finding it more and more challenging to do so. So in a word, they're becoming more disconnected. Why? Well, there's lots of reasons why. We all are familiar with them. I'm going to highlight three that are really important in, in the United States that have really worked to disconnect students and communities at large. The first might be surprising and maybe not applicable to those in Europe as much, but is air conditioning. In the 1950s, air conditioners became affordable and residential. All of a sudden, people that used to be out on their porch, used to be, hello, Tom, as Tom walked by the house. Hello, Sally, how was church today? 
They used to go out to the street and walk around and go to the park and hang out with each other and ask questions and show up in community centers like this. Now they're like, air conditioning. I'm in my house by myself, cut off the community, died a little. And then, of course, the one that's most obvious is the television. The Teatron, the Teatron went from an out exterior place to the living room. Hey, you get all everything you need. Politics, discourse, entertainment, comedy, tragedy, every night, for free, ostensibly, in your air-conditioned home. I have less and less need to go out and be in communion to be in communion, to see other people. And then the last one is the most obvious one. If I say the date January 29th, 2007, you say January 29th, 2007. iPhone. iPhone. Bingo. The release of the iPhone. Dead. Community. <laughs> Done. <laughs> yeah. Another one that's being argued in a similar uh, forum is the, the, the automatic garage door opener. Because <laughs> you don't have to get out of your car and say hello to you, just you open know, it, go in. You, would you please talk to my wife? I'm still trying to get one installed in my house. <laughs> but yes, yeah, yeah, yeah. So, and I live in Los Angeles, so we don't actually, you know, I grew up in New York City when we were on trains and buses together, you're bumping up against humanity. I live in Los Angeles, now I get in my car, I don't see anybody. I mean, I see them on the, so, yeah. So, okay, so we're familiar with all these things, but this is what, as teachers, we're up against. And as an actor, I'm trying to get someone to go to that shamanistic place. Never mind just, like, look up and breathe. But get them to vibrate with an ancient Greek text or Shakespeare or a contemporary playwright. So I see my students, what do I see? I see them losing their body, literally, their soul, their energy, their joy, their spontaneity is going into this device. That their ability to play freely, to trust themselves on a fundamental level of just coming up here and going, I don't know what will happen, but I'll be okay. I probably won't die. So all's well, right? In short, they have troubles even seeing what's right in front of them. They become much more passive. Obviously passive consumers, we know that. They don't realize to what extent they're being manipulated by the actual technology that they're addicted to. So the result of this is it's obvious is that the human connection is becoming harder and harder to find. And for young people, they're getting less and less practice at it, right? Less connection means less communion. Less communion means less communities, which makes it harder for all of us to have shared, cathartic experiences. So, as you probably know, my, my, my students would rather than, than, than call David, I would send him a text message and actually pick up the phone and call him and have a conversation. My own 14-year-old daughter is guilty of this. I'm like, why didn't you just call your mother? I'd rather text her. They text each other to seduce each other. They text each other to break up with each other. They try. They try, yeah. They have apps, at least on our campus I know of, where they have sexual hookups on these happy kid apps that get them together. They spend countless hours watching pornography and mistaking that for making love. I'm deeply worried. I love my students and I'm worried. So, we're living in modern cities, we've got modernity, technology, and I think all, in a way, stripped us of our own relationship to our body. In a way, Ken Robinson, I'll steal this from Ken Robinson, he said that the, 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 the body is the way that academics think it's to, to use to, a vehicle to transport the brain around from conference to conference, right? So, in a way, we become desensitized to our own bodies. When even if you see and you look at people in the street, there's a sadness, just moving through space and time. Right? Heads bent mindlessly and endlessly towards cold and personal screens. In a way, what I see are laments without a lament. Where's the cry? So man is slowly becoming computerized. We know that. The synchronicity is near. It's a great book again, right? It's becoming more one-dimensional, solitary, and ultimately isolated. We're isolating and isolating and isolating. And this all affects a young person's ability to transform themselves imaginary and under imaginary circumstances. I mean, I'm an actor, I'm a professional human being. I lend all of myself out to the playwright and the director. All of myself. But I have to do that under imaginary circumstances. So I see today, today my students are afraid to really cry. They're afraid to laugh. They're afraid to feel deeply. To breathe. They're free to fail, to make mistakes, not get it right. They're silent, they do not dance, they do not sing, they do not risk, they do 
element. So, we all kind of experience this in our own ways. However, what I look to as a teacher in the theater is the idea of the actor's body of being a professional human being creating true artistic and dramatic connections with others. And I look to the ancient Greeks for this. The desire to achieve this openness is hardwired in all of us to move civilization forward, right? The Greeks understood that this process of coming together in a, in, a, in a space and time, literally sharing dramatic stories, was to move civilization forward. So the ancient Greeks understood this, that the theater had to be a sacred space that had value to communities and society. So I'm trying to train young people to walk into that sacred space and commit themselves to it. I've got to ask them to open their bodies, open their minds, their breath, their imaginations. And I've got to get them to go to Grecian epic proportions, not just television. I spent a long time on television. I bought a house with it. But it's right here. It is not the theater. So, I'm trying to get young people to be capable, as Deuce has said, to be possessed, to allow their bodies to be by their imagination, like a shaman. But I can't because of one word, fear. They are afraid. And I don't know about you and where you live and what country you live in and what, where you teach, but I see fear on the rise. I feel it in the room. My students are afraid. They're afraid to open up to each other. They're afraid of the future. They're afraid of the world around them. And, and frankly, who can blame them? The problem with fear is you can't see when you're afraid. Because what fear does, and this is the whole semester's course, so we don't have time right now, but fear takes your attention and puts it right on yourself. It awakens the ego, not in a Freudian sense, but in a sense of awareness, which we call performance, self-consciousness. And if I'm thinking about myself and how I'm doing while I'm doing it, I don't see you at all, because I'm self-absorbed. And so what I see in the room with young people is a group of they're not by any, they're, they're not malicious. They are so self-absorbed, they can't see the world around them. So my job is to get in there as an actor trainer and kind of open them up. Right? How am I doing? Where am I at? I'm good? Yeah. So I've got, I'm almost there. The problem is the more they feel, sorry, the more they feel fear, the more they turn to their technology. It's literally like a baby's blanket. You see them go, you think, no, I can't. Right? And of course, I think some of you have uh, medical backgrounds in here, you know that the, the rates of ADD, ADHD, depression are on the rise because of this. And unfortunately, in the United States, I'm a father of two daughters, very concerned about this because social media is having a devastating effect on young women, in particular. And there's increasing levels of suicide rates in the United States for young women. It's terrible. So I feel the job in our theater department is to really get people to back and connect. I don't care if they become professional actors at all, right? But if they're able to breathe and see and be in space and time and in reality and exchange with other people, so great. So to end this on a, on a good note, what's the anecdote to all this? What are the lessons that we can learn from the echoes of the ancient theaters? Where they know? Well, I look to catharsis, right? If, if, and I know there's debate about Aristotle's definition of catharsis and what it actually meant, but I'm just gonna go for the kind of traditional Purging of fear. Literally, the purging of fear. Well, how? what better thing to do to take theater right now and the, move, the, the thing about catharsis and put it together with a time when people are incredibly afraid and how do we get them to purge that fear? Yeah? So they can move back into the seeing place and look beyond themselves. All right, so how do we get young people to turn and look beyond themselves? Well, this is what we're up against every day in the theater department. I push back against the digital void every day. Yeah. Um, so, let me give you, like, there's, like, there's so much that goes into actor training and camera. But I'll give you some, like, little highlights of what we do. The first thing I do is I walk into the space and time and go, stop. Because we're all moving so quickly. And we're moving most quickly up here, what the Buddhists call the monkey mind. And so I help my students build a new relationship to time. We start with the Buddhist mantra. We have very little time. So we're going to go 
very slowly. There's an American uh, landscape painter, you might have heard of Georgia O'Keeffe. She's got a great quote about this. No one ever really sees a flower. It takes time to see a flower. Like having a friend takes time. So literally just getting out people in the room and kind of getting them to sleep. The second one that goes right in time is breathing. Breath. The word inspiration. To inspire. If you all just do me a favor right now, just notice your breath right now. I know some of you are giving papers right after me, so maybe your heart's moving a little quickly, so I'll help you out here. Just notice your relationship to your lips, please. And if your lips are touching each other, I'll ask you to just let your lips separate a little bit. And notice what happens. So when we begin to slow down and breathe, and then, here's the key part, target our attention outside of ourselves. So you need to get more interested in seeing the world around you than how you are doing it. Okay? And of course, this takes a long time. It takes at least four years, and we barely made a scratch, but at least they've got some tools when we leave. So obviously, just to, to wrap this up a bit, you know, we work on curiosity, we work on failure. There's another kind of a theater Buddha, uh, Sandal Beckett. He's got a great quote. His students are so afraid to fail. I said, they're just like, what's the, what's the right way to do it? And it's, it becomes a straitjacket where they're paralyzed. And like, so Beckett, Samuel Beckett said, have you ever tried? Have you ever failed? Try again. Fail again. Fail better. Fail better is one of our mantras, and they have it on t-shirts, which is great. Um, so obviously we work on developing their courage, getting them to understand that courage, the Latin heart, like, to work for them, to open their hearts. They're not going to get to catharsis, okay, if their hearts are shut, shut off. Um, their ability to listen. All of the training that we work on, like, you know, I was sitting there right close to the end, and I was a little nervous. I go, oh, it's showtime. But the thing I reminded myself of, one thing was to breathe, and two, that vulnerability is my greatest strength. And that works really <coughs> anathema to the messaging we're getting from modern society. Don't, at least in America, don't be weak. Don't be weak. And actually our strength, I'm, I practice something called Aikido. You know, if you practice Aikido, it's a, it's a martial art, but it's not harmony, right? Well, that's about just being vulnerable to the world and accepting the energy around it. So, what we need is for us, an actor to become, um, Oh, right, so it's no longer acceptable to simply, from my point of view, just simply train actors as we used to do to do classical texts to get up and act. It's really, that doesn't work anymore. For the contemporary performer, we need to get them to be a combatant, right? To become confrontational and resist the never-ending wave of the plague, the homeostasis, and disconnection going on in my technology and the modern world. The actor must learn to learn from the sacred spaces of the theater process and the edifices themselves, to act what is obscene, obscene, off stage. Because the Dionysian energy, the energy of the actor, has two parts to it. It's eros, love, and sex. Can you help me with the pronunciation here? Thanatos? Yeah. Just try it again. Fail, fail better. Thanatos. Thanatos. The god of death. So these are the two energies we're really working with in the Grecian sense. So I'll leave you with a quote from an American uh, Pulitzer Prize winning playwright. Uh, her name is Paula Vogel. If you've not heard of her, she's quite extraordinary. And she says this. We, we don't let ourselves be disturbed we continue to do revivals of plays because they're safe, because we think ourselves immune to the disturbance of a Tennessee Williams. A new play doesn't allow us to go into the shield armored against disturbance. The Greek root of the word obscene, obscene, literally means off stage. Yet the purpose of theater is to bring into public exactly that which is kept off stage. So, the performer from antiquity is what I look to, is the definition of a combatant body, someone, the artist, a shaman who's willing to do this. 
to walk through the paradox, to bring the dance of obscenity into the orchestra and disturb the air of the seeing place and use the totality of their human energy. And the performer must be at the center of the theatrical action with all their vulnerable humanity. The battle, the war we must now stage, is not a literal war against the neighboring Persians. It's against an unseen, ubiquitous enemy, modernity and technology. Today's Thespians must sacrifice themselves in the altar of art and must, as Duza said, dissolve the ego. Why? Because ego is fear, and fear is ego. And the only way to quiet the ego is to get the attention off of the self. You have to be, and young people need to be more interested in what's outside of themselves than themselves themselves. To see, you need to go outside of yourself. You need to go to the seeing place. So for the moment, Dionysus is missing. He's in exile. The idea of the confrontational man is lost the road to Ithaca has disappeared. We, what we strive to train is a human being Aeschylus would want on their stage, strong enough in their vulnerability to invite deep, true, honest, unprotected connection, to have the courage to see clearly and precisely what is right in front of them. Will it be found? Well, the last word of the theater will never be told. Will Dionysus return? Well, only if we're capable of truly seeing one another. successfully, not always happily, from the old political military center it had been into a university, a tourist town, a trade hub, a school for outsiders. And as such towns often do, it had come to realize how precious and saleable its cultural history was. It began with the help of visiting students and teachers to discover treasure, in this case staged, produced, scenarioed, spoken treasure, in its past, and all at once the rest of urban Greece did not like that. The city-states of Greece had for centuries competed hard against one another. The sudden lessening of competition when Athens became Rome's favorite in Greece, first after the Second Punic War and then after the, the Macedonian, and even more after the Mithridates, meant that fresh prosperity came to almost everything Athenian. The student crowd that saved the town from bankruptcy had at first been the eastern elite families of Alexander's successors and their management class. Now it was Roman, Western, Greek Western, as often as Italian or Spanish, North African or Iranian or Central Asian, but full of a feeling of cultural, not inferiority, but a cultural lack, a cultural sort of incompleteness. The Attic um, or Athenian drama was one of the things that, that attracted people. And the Athenian drama now became a great demand in the West and in, the, in Central Asia, and Athens geared up to fill the demand. It went into business in Greece first to do that. Um, Athenian drama had been, after Alexander, the one time-honored Athenian export that provincial, to provincial towns that didn't seem to imply overlordship. But traveling shows in those days had been occasional and casual. The Attic Dionysia Guild now began to travel with shows everywhere, and it was selling well. And from the Roman point of view, nothing could be better. A willing ally, an agreeable, energetic, familiar client of Rome, becoming the new voice through the smaller towns of Greece was a good thing. And traveling troops putting on classical Athenian plays made the voice of Athens feel legitimate and authentically Greek. But there were some competitors. 
entertainers, acting troops, and the rest of Greece. And they had a loose guild organization that began visiting local Greek political assemblies and complaining about something that sounds very modern, what we might now call cultural imperialism. Athens wasn't supposed to be the voice of the rest of Greece, but often audiences all through the landscape flocked for chances to see the classic plays. And a lawsuit was raised before the Roman governor up in Macedonia. They went up to Macedonia because Athens was the biggest law courts down here, and you know how that would come out. Uh, his name was Publius Cornelius, the date was 138 or 134, and they demanded that the Attic League expel the Athenians from barnstorming their productions through the countryside, and especially from entering them in local drama competitions, which they usually won. The cultural imperialism crisis of the first century was not only surprisingly modern, but it had to be pretty perplexing to decide that the new success of the Athenian Dionysiac Guild in its drama, presumably its point of view, along with the idea that Athens framed political drama was about what every other community in the world did, it wasn't something the Roman governor wanted to stop, besides being politically correct. The very fact that Athenian artists were somehow not as authentically Dionysiac anymore in their ritual activities made them appealing. Romans tended to have to shrug off a chill that ran up the spine when they heard the word Dionysiac these days. Uh, more authentic Dionysiac outbreaks had caused great scandal both in Greece and Italy a few years earlier, the sort of panic older generations felt in Europe and the United States in the 1960s. Therapeutic effects or no, traditionalist families were worried about that kind of thing. So Cornelius hesitated and advanced the appalling suggestion that Athenians be admitted as members to the wider Greek pamphletic body of actors and drama troops, the very groups that felt threatened by Athenian plays and productions. And of course, this just meant that they would have more Athenian dramatic actors, more Athenian dramatic artists dominating the Hellenic guild and winning more of the contests. The governor was ignored as far as possible, and the member poles of the general guild tried to simply boycott Athenian players. Athens had realized it had a major opportunity to sell culture, first in Greece and then gear up to, to sell it in the rest of the world. And it used the ties next that Romans had occurred to develop with the old crumbling town of Delphi to ask for a guild charter of sorts. Allowing unimpeachable credentials, they would now be the media fountainhead for the voice throughout Greece, and Delphi would have said so. The Amphictyonic Council decided in their favor in the 80s, but just at that moment, Anatolia invaded and everything fell apart in the war. The key here is how the odd highlight shows Athens becoming the transmitter of broadcast Greek culture into the developing West and East over the Roman centuries. It was Athenian theater that was the star attraction and the, and the, and the, the real media push and the source of an imitation and in this case of complaint. A visitor to Athens in these years could not possibly miss this. Athens, as it passed into the shadow of Rome, it became the university town that lit the shadow. It was full of monuments of the old classical age that impressed the eye and brought to life old stories of power players and thinkers, of heroes and against impossible odds and traitors and marauders and explorers who had poked into new regions of the Mediterranean or Asia or Africa and the mind. But the theater, in the theater of Dionysus and the streets sweeping around the Acropolis to it, the city had a monument to the lost arcade that spoke all the time. The old theater had, at its fourth century entryway, now featured the statues of Aeschylus, Sophocles, and Euripides. The theater now began to appear as a kind of advertisement for the whole city, on coins minted for circulation in the international market at Delos. Coins minted in Athens were used in Athens. Coins minted out on the island of Delos were used everywhere else in the Mediterranean and were operated essentially as postcards or business cards or, or advertisements. Delos, like Athens, also sold copies of the old plays. The reason Western writers like Terence came market mining for manuscripts and antiquities, dealers and crooks and con artists like the Pelican of Teos, <coughs> smuggling operations to make more money getting them into the rest of the world. Athenian drama had become a cultural monument, the chief glory of which lay not in the writing of new works, but in the successful production of old ones. The street running from the Prytaneus in the uh, Agora up along the east edge of the Acropolis to the theater entrance is essentially today's Adriana curving around into Dionysus area Pagitu. had for a long time become the focus of real competition in the image of how the town, town dominated the theatrical world. It was clustered along its upslope side by the tripod and colander monuments of the Koregi, whose productions had won prizes. By this time, perhaps three or four hundred of them, only one remains today. 
Along that gallery scrolled the theater goers and the shoppers who wanted to mingle with the crowd and pretend they were theater goers. And the street itself terraced out over the hillside and everyone along it as they went through the shops and the cafes, the taverna toward the theaters, shared not just the experience of the old plays, renewed themselves instead also as part of the city's street culture which the plays spilled over into. What? The locals and students and visitors are all like sharing the keeping of a tradition. The, the advertisement here is, is a fairly obvious one, and the city, um, using Delphi as its, uh, pro, as its pro proclaiming source, actually passed an advertisement of itself which reads this way in 117. Athens is, and the Athenian theater is, the inaugurator of all human blessings, the guide of men's life from beef, that of beast to gentle culture, the establisher, in fact, of the social organism altogether. It's pretty arrogant. The, the service she rendered through the dissemination of her mysteries and proclaimed herself the important value to human beings of mutual aid and confidence among people. She passed through on, and on to others the education and laws with which the gods had endowed her. She claimed that though the grain, the grain of culture metaphor, had been given to her as a special property, she had made it everyone's heritage. She was, Athens, besides the originator of music and dramatic art, the founder and developer of tragedy and comedy, the first to introduce Himelic and histrionic competitions. It was this idea that Athens spoke not just in classrooms, but in theater spaces, that framed the city that stayed alive when Greece no longer itself was independent. The Apostle Paul, when he finally arrived, thought it was important enough to, to include fragments and bits from dramatists uh, in his uh, speech arguing Christianity along with bits of mystics and poets. It had to have been an interesting failure of confidence, a sort of uh, obviously an evidence of declining interest, when at the end of the empire, not because of Christianity, but because of the siege that the empire was, was enduring, Athenians found theater attendance finally so heavily in decline they began attempting to promote gladiatorial combats on the old stages. And this a century before Christianity really came to that city. It was not Christianity that killed the culture of theater in Athens, but the change in the empire itself. The sense of siege required different skills from the educational centers, not introspection and queries about justice or virtue or the opening of, of, of the human personality, but motivational propaganda, which classicists call the second sophistic. As I argued in the title, when the Athenian theater went from being borrowed, imitated, bent, belittled, it was still treasured in the classroom, in the cafes, in the memoirs of alumni like Aulus Gellius, who wrote an entire book that consists of old men sitting in Taverna reminiscing about how plays and moments on the street and acting moments were all done and how what they meant in life and how they went with the next snack that you had or the next drink. When the empire fell, the scholarship and monuments went to Constantinople and then survived, and from there in the 1450s to the west with the refugees. But even in its collapse, the voice of Athenian theater was always, somehow, somewhere, everywhere, irrepressibly speaking. Uh, including the ruler, uh, Pericles at the time. 
And Athenians, in fact, in the countryside were directed by their leader during the war with Sparta to retreat behind the city walls, uh, causing overcrowding in an already well-populated city. So Athens was being attacked by the Peloponnesian Spartans from the outside and the plague from the inside. So the contemporary historian Thucydides, who himself was afflicted by the disease but survived, documented the plague in the history of the Peloponnesian War. So this was a, quite a significant event um, in the history of uh, uh, ancient Greece. So he said the plague thought began in Ethiopia and entered Athens through Piraeus, uh, the city's port and sole supply of food and supplies. However, others hypothesized that water reservoirs were potentially poisoned by the Peloponnesians. So there were different competing theories at the time. So possible causes of the plague were thought to include all sorts of different infectious agents, communicable diseases such as typhus, smallpox, measles, bubonic plague, even an ancient strain of the Ebola virus. However, in the late 90s, as part of the uh, Athens 2004 Olympics infrastructure projects, in building one of the metro stations, Keramikos, they came across a grave, a very large grave site, and they noticed that the grave actually changed um, uh, significantly. And the theory or the hypothesis was, you know, the uh, ancient Athenians had rituals for uh, funerals. However, they noticed that these graves changed, and they, it suggested there was a lot of chaos. There was a lot of uh, disharmony in the area, just how the skeletons were found. And they were thought uh, this was uh, directly related to the plague, the mass deaths that occurred. Anyways, uh, people that uh, uh, I guess I associate with more regularly biologists, molecular microbiologists, uh, found DNA uh, from the tooth pulp of these skeletons. And they confirmed uh, that this plague of Athens was caused by Salmonella typhi, otherwise known as typhoid fever. So moving on, I mean, the important, other than the fact that we know now what the plague was of Athens, the impact of the plague actually was quite significant in um, poetry and uh, drama. So you can see Sophocles, uh, Oedipus the King, Roman of Trachis, and uh, Euripides, Hippolytus, uh, all these plays, ancient theaters, were actually uh, impacted by the plague. And you can see that there was a high, uh, apologize, a higher incidence of, of words for the disease, nosos or limos, with heroes and communities from the mythical past in the throes of diseases, both real and metaphorical. So that is two and a half thousand years ago, and we have a framework from two and a half thousand years ago of a plague and its impact on theater and performance. If we fast forward this and come into sort of a time that we're all, or most of us in this room, familiar with is this current plague of HIV, which has been around since the late 80s, about 40 years. So it's thought to have originated in the Democratic Republic of Congo, where a virus jumped from uh, a primate species into humans, so sending immunodeficiency virus into humans. And why is this significant? Well, other than the fact that it's claimed millions of lives, well over 30 million lives, um, and it's global, not uh, local. Um, it also had quite a bit of an impact on the music industry. So Hugh, you had mentioned about song being therapeutic uh, for the soul, the catharsis. And this was in fact, you know, they said the ancient Greeks believed in the healing powers of song, what we would call poetry, since Greek poetry was chanted or sung. And again, sort of the religious chanting that comes with a lot of um, uh, denominations. Anyway, you can see songs written about HIV. Uh, this is just a sample of several. Uh, and they were often meant to remember someone loved. And again, the therapeutic process of losing someone. So HIV's impact now on the music industry. If anyone's seen the Bohemian Rhapsody movie of late, uh, you're familiar with Freddie Mercury. And again, uh, you know, very, very uh, major impact of HIV, a modern plague on um, a famous uh, uh, performer. But what was interesting here, uh, that despite the war in Athens, despite all the problems, fear persisted, continued, 
because of its therapeutic effect, because of its impact, because it was to make humanity progress. And what was interesting here in this comment, recalling uh, Mercury's performance during the recording, uh, recording Brian May states, I said, Fred, I don't know if this is going to be possible to sing. You know, he's on, on death's doorstep, essentially, Freddie Mercury. And he went on, I'll do it, with a little adjective there, darling. Vodka down and went in and killed it. Completely lacerated that vocal. Rolling Stone, April 2003. That's what Brian May said about Freddie Mercury. So he's on death's doorstep, dying from a modern plague, but he went on to do the performance. Similar to Greeks, dying, there's a plague, but they will continue moving on uh, with their uh, art and therapeutic. Modern day theater, the very first movie on HIV in the mid 80s of early frost, but a young lawyer who hadn't told his parents about his homosexuality, now he must tell them at a time when the diagnosis was still a death sentence, that he had AIDS. So this had received you know, all sorts of awards, outstanding writing for a movie, miniseries, Golden Globe, uh, won the Peabody Award, nominated for 14 uh, Emmy Awards. It's a release November 11th, 1985, National Broadcasting Corporation. But what was interesting with this, and there's a whole series of other movies as well, but despite its critical acclaim, it is believed that NBC lost revenue because advertisers were leery about sponsoring the film in the mid-80s. And here is the parallel to ancient Greece. It's, that it's felt here, it is possible that the depiction of a fictional play to an audience that was still suffering from a real one, and in language regarded as dangerous in itself, was responsible for Sophocles' unusual second place finish in the competition amongst tragedian, uh, tragedians at the festival of Dionysus that year. So when Sophocles was speaking of the plague in Athens, in his, per in, in his performance, uh, and in the performance uh, based on his work, he didn't rank first place as usual. Again, the parallel with HIV in theater in the mid-80s. It was, in fact, all these uh, considered incredible, but not first place, at least from the advertiser's perspective. Anyways, the impact of HIV on modern-day celebrity, I mean, the plague of Athens killed Pericles. Um, uh, Thucydides was infected but survived and there are countless other famous Greeks who were impacted by this infection. In uh, no short order here, you can see HIV and the number of individuals um, in the modern day that are being impacted. And as an infectious disease physician uh, who started his career in the early 90s, we were giving 15 to 25 pills a day to keep people alive. Now we can give one pill with three medications that's not only keeping people alive, but it's actually got a better prognosis than diabetes, which has been around for 60, 70, yeah. So it's, uh, you know, since insulin was discovered, we've had very little progress, but with HIV, the prognosis of someone with HIV as a chronic, controllable disease is better than diabetes. But anyways, the impact of royalty on HIV, because there's a lot of uh, discussion in Thucydides' work of royalty and plague and theater uh, in ancient uh, Greece. But here's an example of Princess Diana at the time shaking a hand of an HIV patient. And she showed in a single gesture that this was a condition needing compassion and understanding, not fear and ignorance. The point that you were making about fear. The impact of celebrity on HIV. Some of you may recognize, especially in the US, this individual right now, uh, Nancy Pelosi and uh, Elizabeth Taylor. But this was an impact here of someone uh, of someone who uh, said, you know, why isn't anyone doing anything about this uh, plague? Elizabeth Taylor and said, you know, and then said, oh my God, I'm actually just as guilty as those other individuals. I wasn't doing anything to help. So she determined to speak out against hypocrisy and discrimination after observing how her longtime friend, Rob Hudson, who died of AIDS, suffered. So, and this now you saw Nancy Pelosi, Elizabeth Taylor, and the impact of politics in HIV. In ancient Athens, during the Peloponnesian War and the plague, there was discussion amongst the Athenian legislature about, in fact, attacking um, other areas, other uh, communities to engage in a broader war. And they weren't sure, based on the plague, not actually their combat with Sparta, if this was, in fact, going to occur. So the cradle of democracy 
was actually very, very highly impacted by a plague, by a disease that was being spread amongst individuals. Not much different than HIV. So when the Reagan administration you know, uh, had remained silent when the HIV epidemic was declared, despite protests advocating for additional uh, funding for research. His press secretary, Larry Speaks, if anyone remembers him, repeatedly shrugged off the AIDS crisis when asked to address the mounting number of AIDS cases nationwide, often responding to questions with a mixture of laughter, jokes, and an air of indifference. However, at the end of his presidency, Ronald Reagan labeled AIDS as public enemy number one. Not much different than the Athenian legislature, where they were poo-pooing the plague at the beginning, but by the end, they noticed that this was actually having such a dramatic effect on their politics, on their performances, and on their uh, plays, and, and so on, uh, that this was not something just to be chopped up to be something um, insignificant. So, in summary, in ancient theater, the societal effects of communicable diseases can be as important as their biological effects. The plague of Athens in 430 BC that occurred during conflict with Sparta is deemed to have altered the cradle of democracy. The play of ancient Athens was echoed throughout tragic drama of this period. The panic created by the play influenced directly the Athenian social imagination and culture and left a lasting mark actually on ancient theater. The play is palpable in the language of plays in ancient Athens for this period, as it is in modern uh, theater. Plays, performances, and all politics all influence and overlap with each other over time. Artists, artists help people cope with plagues. In ancient Athens, through song, poetry, and theater, in the current era, through songs and film. I'm quoting here uh, from uh, one of the uh, scholars. Uh, the issues surrounding the Athenian war with Sparta and the general political health of Athens were portrayed in theater. The sanctuary of Dionysus, regularly between 430 and 404 BC. After 420 BC, the plague that Thucydides had described witness a decline in social conduct and morality that led to a diseased body politic, and then Athens lost the war to Sparta. So poets, artists could heal, but only so much, perhaps because their patient politicians become unwilling to listen. On that note, thank you very much for your time. Of the blessed along the shore of deep swirling ocean, 
happy heroes for whom the grain giving earth bears honey sweet fruit flourishing thrice a year, far from the deathless gods and Kronos rules over them. Unquote. So he's his term uh, in Greek for these islands, and pardon my pronunciation of attempts at ancient Greek. Uh, his term was the Makaron Mi Soisi. Nearly three centuries later, it is a second Olympian ode from 476 BCE. Pindar takes up this theme, though he reduces the number of blessed islands to one. It becomes the Makaron Nasos. Here we read from Pindar that souls who are, quote, free from all wrongdoing, follow Zeus's road to the end, to the Tower of Kronos, where the ocean breezes blow around the island of the blessed, and flowers of gold are blazing some from splendid trees on land, while other, while water nurtures others. In other words, it's a pretty nice place to end up. And exactly who goes there and why is has been a subject of a lot of debate uh, about Pindar's text and, and the Hebrew as well. So it's not my understanding why, a bit more than two millennia later, if we're talking about the period right around 1800 now, or the romantic period that is the main focus of my own research. Um, poets who are also devoted Hellenists would wish to take up this image of the Blessed Islands, the Makaro Nasos, once again. And there are plenty of them who do that I found references to, including from Erasmus Darwin, Shelley Keats, Byron in Germany, Goethe, Schiller, Hildeling, to mention just a few. And uh, today I want to look just briefly at two examples, one from uh, Friedrich Hildeling and one from Lord Byron. We both wrote a lot about Greece and won. Byron, of course, spent a fair amount of time in Greece. My argument here is that within, within these two different poetic applications of this ancient image of the Islands of the Blessed, we can also see two distinct and disparate approaches to Romantic Hellenism. One that's philosophical, and one that we might call political or historical. So they, these poets, we can see, taking up the same image they get from Tendar and Hesiod using it in different ways within this romantic Hellenism. So let's start with Hildeling. He's the comes first chronologically. So as I was reading um, uh, last year, Dundar's second Olympian, oh, we did an English translation. I was stuck, struck with that line that I just quoted, uh, quote, where ocean breezes blow around the island of the blessed, etc. And that's, that island of the blessed image has long fascinated me, so I took a look at the original and again, in my weak Greek, it's something like Pentha Makaron, Nasos Okeanidas, Aurai Peri Pneoisin. The last, the, the Peri around Pneoisin, like pneumatic in English, breathing, blowing around. Okay. The ocean breezes blow around the island. Now, the syntax there, though, of the Makaron Nasos. It has a genitive plural coming before the thing possessed, which doesn't work very well in English, of the blessed ones, the island. So it's not the islands that are blessed, it's the blessed people, the island of the blessed people, or the blessed ones. And it struck me as sounding a lot like the syntax of some of Hulderlin's own poetry, and Hulderlin also, among other things, translated a lot of Pindar. And so I looked up that passage, and indeed, um, his translation follows that syntax of Pindar almost exactly. But a Zeligen Insel Okeanida Lifta Um Adnan, where if I were to translate Pindar, uh, totally the translation of Pindar in English, literally something like, where of the blessed ones, the island, ocean, breezes blow around. It's a clear effort on Pulitzer's part to make modern German sound like or be reminiscent of Pindar's Greek, which at the time, didn't go over very well, but then the 20th century later, people found very interesting his use of language in that way. And at the same time, I would note that the German verb, the Om Atman, um, that like the Greek, combines this prefix, the uh, preposition, Om, around, with breathe, breathe around into one verb. So in that sense, Holy is able to do something with German and Greek 